This is the Energizing India podcast. Vikramaditya Gaurineni is executive director of Amara Raja Batteries. He graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in a degree in biochemistry and initially joined the Amara Raja Group in 2013 as a management executive, where he undertook various functional responsibilities across this business. Later, he held important positions within the group, including managing director and CEO of Amara Raja Power Systems and managing director of Amara Raja Electronics. Today, we chat with Vikram on our program to talk about Amara Raja Group. Vikram, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jovan. Great to be here. Vikram, first up, tell us a little bit about yourself. You're a young lad, uh, having seen the world, been in the US, decided to come back to the family business. Um, how's that entire journey been? Are you missing the United States or happy to be back? Uh, I think uh, the short answer first is I'm very happy to be back. Uh, I wouldn't really call it being back because I didn't spend you know, most of my youth here. I was uh, born in India, went at a very young age, you know, hardly months. I was about two, three months the first time we went to the US and then by the time I was nine months, we more or less settled there. So I think I came to India when I was 23. So while it's technically coming back, I didn't really spend enough time here to ever really you know, uh, understand or embrace every aspect of it. But I think it's really great to be here. And uh, I think when I came back to India around 2013, it was, a, it was a great time to be in India and it wasn't the best time to be in the United States. I think there's a lot of things that are changing. Uh, job market wasn't great. They were going through their own challenges, whereas India, I think, has just been on like a unimpeded growth story for you know the last, at least as long as I've been here. And I've been coming back every summer as a kid. So the amount of opportunity that's uh, being presented here, I think it kind of overwrites anything I regret about you know having left. I miss small things, but I think overall, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I think the journey here was great because while I came, uh, you know, fresh uh, from the United States, almost everything around that time, 2013, 2014, India was also happening fresh for the first time, right? New technologies were getting introduced. I think uh, uh, what I found is since I've been a kid and keep coming back every summer to India, maybe once upon a time, the lag between something being released in other parts of the world and coming to India may have been, you know, years. Now it's like days and seconds, right? Everything's happening at the same time. So. When we're talking about this massive journey of going to electric mobility, in many ways, we're ahead of the United States, right? Maybe we don't have our Teslas and stuff, but the advantage of having this light local mobility scene, that's happening very quietly, but even when I, I just came back from a trip to China, they're also astounded at how quickly the two-wheeler, three-wheeler space and you know, niche areas in India are electrifying. So I think in many ways, we are going to be leaders in certain select segments in this area. I, that's a great answer. I have to agree with you. I was at uh, EVS 36, the, the, the world's biggest EV charging show, uh, which was in California last week. And I did get the distinct impression that in some pockets, India is ahead of America. Um, and I completely agree with you. You know, in the old days, in the old days, maybe just 10 years ago, you had to wait months before something came to India. And now it's the other way around. In fact, some things come to India before they get to the rest of the world. So it's a, it's quite an exciting time, absolutely, to be uh, not only just in India, but also in the in the electric and clean mobility space. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, what is Amara Raja Group doing in this space? Now, you've been in the battery space for the longest time. You're, you're, you're one of India's largest lead acid battery manufacturers, um, the mainstay of the battery industry in India. Um, however, the lead acid industry has taken its time to move to newer chemistries. And lithium was something that came almost by surprise. It was like the ICE industry with the EV in some ways. It took a Tesla to wake up the ICE industry to move to uh, to electric vehicles. And it seemed the same in lithium, didn't it? Because the traditional lead acid battery manufacturers took a long time to open to lithium. And it was other uh, manufacturers, either companies that were making their own uh, electric cars or electric scooters that needed to make their own batteries that moved on this space first. And then the mainstay of the industry followed. What has been the journey at Amara Raja looking at lithium Lithium and newer chemistries, whether it's sodium and beyond, uh, maybe even graphite and superconductors, um, from your traditional lead acid mainstay business. Uh, so I'd say that uh, our view has really, really changed about this over the last uh, three to five years. I think earlier we had the, it was an advantage at the time. We were uh, partnered with the largest lead acid battery company in the world. It was a 26, 26 JV between my family and the Johnson Controls. So it was always kind of, we could always watch what JCI was doing around the world, follow them. And, uh, you know, like I said earlier, it's like follow the leader approach. 
But I think as we started waiting longer and longer, and I, I, I'm happy to say we didn't wait too long, but uh, the largest lead acid players in the world, like Johnson Controls, like uh, you know, Enersys, et cetera, some of the really big players, they never took the opportunity to try to make a strong pivot to newer technologies. So I think the theme of what we're doing is we're no longer trying to follow what the rest of the world is doing, especially in our industry. And I think uh, by doing that, it's kind of fearlessly saying, you know, there's a lot of risk. I don't know if uh, lithium is a much, uh, you know, big boys game that we shouldn't be in, but we're going to attempt. And I don't think you'll find that many lead acid players around the world have actually taken the opportunity to try to pivot, right? So I, I you know, I can't say how successful we'll be, but right now we're not waiting. What we're saying is there's a, India's a unique situation. We have a long, uh, still a long road left in which we need, in which we need lead acid batteries, uh, you know, for the automotive sector, no matter how quickly we're kind of uh, penetrating in certain segments, cars, buses, other things, they take some time. And uh, even if uh, we're getting to relatively strong penetration numbers 10 years from now, every IC engine that's being deployed between now and then, it'll require a lifetime of support, right, and a replacement market. So we have that advantage where we still have some time to really, you know, even grow slightly our existing business. But at the same time, we're taking a pretty large bet. And uh, recently we announced in Telangana that we're going to be building our first kind of lithium facility. And uh, 9,500 crores, if you really translate it to the larger picture around the world, what other countries and other companies are doing, it looks like a drop in the bucket. But actually for us, what it represents is we're investing almost double of what we've invested over the last 40 years in a single project. So I think, we're embracing the fact that we have to take some risk and we have to kind of go ahead. And uh, if anything, I think, uh, you know, I should also give them respect. Along with us, Excite Industries in India has also been very proactive in saying, listen, we're going to go make a big bet in lithium. So I believe that in that one way also, India will be a leader. Our lead acid companies are being much, much bolder than the rest of the world. So Vikram, I have two questions on that. The first one is the is the elephant in the room. The 9,500 crores you're investing, is that a lithium cell manufacturing plant or a cell packing plant? Are you going to be making cells in India? So the bulk of that is going to come from cell making. And uh, I think right now we're showing an outlay of about 12 to 16 gigawatt hour of cell. And then in addition to that, we're going to be doing about 5 gigawatt hour of packing. I think the reason the pack number is much smaller is because, you know, we expect that there'll be a bigger market like from OEMs and all to get ourselves, but most of them will want to be doing packing and all in-house. So pack, I think we have to be a little bit more selective and see who's really willing to give that market to us. Of course, our stationary customers are quite keen to let us do it, but to these days, even the two-wheeler and three-wheeler guys are questioning whether or not they should give that value addition to us or they want to do it in-house. So we'll come back to that question of packing uh, in a bit. Um, but first up, you made the comment that around the world, the lead acid industry hasn't really taken the plunge into lithium. They've tended to stay in the rivers and streams that they used to, rather than searching waterfalls. Um, you have, uh, after taking some time to analyze the market and see which direction, is, which direction it's going. I'm interested, why is that the case? Does it have to do with the poor competence and the skill sets because the chemistries and processes are so different? Is it because, you know, if you're going to be in lithium, you have to be a big player. And so, you know, your your initial investment has to be at the scale you have uh, committed to, which is 9,500 crores, and that scares away a lot of people. What is the reason that the lead acid industry has been reticent to, to embrace the new chemistries? I think a lot of it has to do with just when you're so dominant and have an incumbent technology, it's not in your interest to kind of want to embrace it, right? I think even from an OEM angle, they fought it a lot more than, you know, they embraced it until recently when they kind of decided that they have to go ahead and do it. And if I can just give like an illustration, one, I think a huge missed opportunity. And we tell them all the time, right? Even though we're not as closely associated anymore. Uh, at the time that the companies like LG, Samsung, the Koreans, the Japanese were making their investments and saying, let's go ahead and kind of, you know, it's like a 20 year lost journey that they, they spent on lithium. And during that time, Johnson Controls, uh, especially before they started doing a bit of restructuring, I think they got up to like 50, 60 billion in revenue. They're as big as any of those guys at that time, especially. And uh, they actually were very proactive. They spent a couple hundred million dollars building like, you know, the first kind of lithium cell facility. It's up in Michigan, in the United States. And I think at that time, BMW was quite aggressive saying, we need lithium batteries. Why don't you go ahead and build this for us? So they took an early bet, but then ultimately, they just decided, okay, it's not making money. I'm used to making this much margin in lead. Why should I kind of burn cash? If you, if, if they, now that I think about it, if they decided, you know, for a decade, okay, 
the, whatever loss I'm making on this lithium facility is not really significant to me, right? It's a, it's not changing my fortunes in any manner. If they stuck with it and they really said, let me just play this out and see how it goes. I have no doubt that Johnson Controls with all the you know, engineering prowess they had, they were people that every OEM in the world wanted to work with when they're launching a new platform because they really understood vehicles, vehicle architecture. They could have been like an LG Chem, they could have been like a CATL. So that I, I think that's a you know very unfortunate, but the biggest missed opportunity in the lithium space, and that would have been you know a Western company with their own supply chains and uh, global presence that have been able to do that. So I don't think there's a good reason is what I would say that lead acid players have shied away from this business. Uh, you, you talked of the pivot, and your pivot was to go from uh, lead acid to lithium, and then of course look at the EV value chain, which we will talk about in, in a second. But I think what makes India unique. And what also makes your company unique in many ways is the fact that even though you're so big, um, you are able to pivot so rapidly um, as the technology uh, uh, change comes upon you. Um, what is it that makes both India and maybe even your business to some extent, uh, I think I have a clue as to why your business does it, but I'm interested in your perspective. What is it that allows Indian companies to be able to pivot and move so quickly uh, when compared to, for example, you've just talked about JCI, but it's not JC, JCI, isn't it? it uh, when you look at our industry, General Motors, Ford completely lost the race. If you look at all the battery companies, they've completely lost the race. We are talking about an entirely new brand of battery companies today, when it's Sony, Panasonic, CATL, Tesla, um, than we were in the past. So you're going to be up there, given the investments you've made, perhaps even given the investments Excite has made. What, what is it in India that makes it so different? That's a great question. I think I'm a little slightly caught off guard. It's an out of syllabus question, but I, you know, I think a lot of the companies you mentioned, they've just started to stagnate over time. It could, maybe they're they're victims of their own success. They've seen great times, and they think that uh, you know, once you believe you've made it, I think that's the day that everything starts to fall apart. Right? Uh, you need to the day you stop being hungry, the day you stop acting desperate for success. I find that even you know, in our own individual situations, we start to kind of just. Uh, relax and take it easy so i think uh, indian companies uh, india as a country we still feel we have yet to make it right we we keep talking about the potential of india but it's like it's not yet reached so we, we still need to keep working for it and i think as long as we keep that attitude and keep that hunger desperation you should say right that maybe this this uh, great attitude of being able to pivot and really move will continue Super, so Vikram, you talked about uh, cell uh, manufacturing as well as cell packing, um, and that's brilliant to see, right? Uh, a couple of questions on that. When are you going to go online? You know, most of the uh, cell manufacturing in India comes online after 2025. What kind of time scale are you looking at? And the second question in rejoining that is, what kind of dependence will you have on China for the supply chain on this? Um, you know, I know we can buy lithium from Australia, we can buy cobalt from Australia, there's places in South America that we can buy raw materials from, but are you, are you delevering from China actively or you know, is that is that just a nonsense? The reality is they dominate and we're, we're going to be first forced to deal with them you know, for the next decade. So your second question is a fun one. I will definitely try to be as unfiltered as possible. But to start with, uh, you know, the cell manufacturing capacity, we're starting out with a phase one which is going to be a you know two-part kind of plant. One is going to be two gigawatt hour of manufacturing, and mostly we're kind of going more with a, a two-wheeler type of cell, a 2170 proven NMC design. And uh, you know during that time also, we may also build in a little bit of flexibility, slightly go higher on the cylindrical size as well. Uh, but the first part of this plant is going to be what we're calling our commercial qualification plant. So it's more like in the megawatt hour, 60 to 100 megawatt hour, depending on the cells we're making, but not really meant to be extremely efficient, but an extremely flexible line. So every time we want to kind of uh, get a new cell out to our customer to get tested and do smaller batch kind of processing, that'll be the first thing. I think that uh, if we can, you know, uh, keep pending some of the approvals and all that to take some of their own time, if we can get construction started in the next month or two, uh, plus 18 months from then is when we want to get that line kind of commissioned and started. And uh, six months after that, so let's say about 24 months to get two gigawatt manufacturing started off. And then every year we'll be adding some capacity to a terminal capacity of about 16 gigawatt hour by 2028. And the pack facility, of course, uh, with also having a little bit of pressure to start up operations in this new location, get some employment generated. That I think we want to be a lot more aggressive. It's also a lot easier to do. So around uh, March or April, we want to have the first kind of products coming out of those lines. 
Uh, to your second question, you know, I think uh, uh, first when we say like how dependent we'll be on China, I think the world has to be dependent on China because they're the, they've been the most proactive, right? Uh, they've been very, very. Uh, I think it's a very vision, uh, visionary kind of uh, stance they've taken on cornering new materials, identifying what those new materials are that the world will require over the next, you know, several decades. So when you think about the major things, I'll have to buy cathode active material, anode active material, uh, separator, electrolyte, the foils. Uh, whether or not it's a you know a Chinese company or not, our end goal is that we want to source from India. So. You know, it can be MNCs coming in investing in India. That would be what we really try to strive for. But in the, you know, when we first start production, I, I really, today we're not mapping more than like 25% from domestic valuation. And I think even that is not such an easy task. So when the production linked incentive went out and they're talking about, you know, you should reach 60%, 70% uh, domestic valuation within this period, it, it'll be a challenge because I think uh, unless Indian players or Indian, you know, a couple of players really, really pull their uh, demand to bring certain critical, you know, parts of the ecosystem to India during that time, it's not like we're the first uh, investment destination at the moment because naturally China is the biggest market. Europe is investing very aggressively. The United States is investing very, very aggressively. So if anybody with, uh, for any of these critical raw materials wants to invest, they'll naturally go where the demand is. We're not going to have such a big demand by 2030 compared to other parts of the world. So we will be quite dependent on China or Chinese sources, I should say. And uh, that I, I don't think there's many ways that we can change that in the immediate future. You know, we talk about uh, some of the lithium finds we have in the northern parts of the country. But is it really realistic that any of those will be coming to market before 2028, 2030? Not likely, right? So I, I do celebrate in the background, but I don't think this is something that will change my fortunes anytime soon. So you talk about uh, NMC. So is that's the chemistry that you've landed upon? I'm interested why NMC, and also from the perspective of our listeners, um, how easy is it for a company such as yours that has made this kind of investment, nine thousand five hundred crores? Do you need to really lock in a chemistry, or is your line flexible to make any sorts of chemistries um, as the market demands it? Um, or you know, is is your advocacy message then going to be? If you're not flexible, take the country down a particular road in a particular chemistry. That's the first one. And then the second one, the second question on the on the, on the cell is, is there one form factor that you're making or are you going to make all sorts of form factors, cylindrical, prismatic, out? And, you know, how's, uh, how have you done your analysis on to arrive on what sort of form factor you should be making for India? Uh, just to kind of write this down. So we talked about chemistry, form factor, and also kind of a uh, let's say fungibility, right, in the flexibility in the plan. Uh, on the chemistry, you know, actually our longer term roadmap sees us putting more on LFP. LFP is where we'll probably have more like 60, 70% of our capacities by the end of this, uh, uh, you know, end of this decade. But the reason we kind of pushed a little bit more aggressive, let's have NMC and a cylindrical cell, a small cylindrical cell as our first product is because India, at least the next few years, where Amaraja is extremely focused is this light local mobility. So what's going to be the most kind of uh, predominant cell that we think is going to go to a two-wheeler because that's going to be the single biggest segment. And even at 2030, when the car market finally starts to kind of come alive, the two-wheeler market and the four-wheeler market are still going to be equal. After that, of course, it'll get outpaced very quickly because simply the size of packs and cars. So that's where we're a little bit focused right now. We want to come out with an NMC. I think also the form factor of 2170 cylindrical, it's a very well-established uh, you know, format. It's uh, there's not a whole lot of, uh, you know, recreating the wheel that we have to do, redesigning the wheel. So that's where we want to go a little bit more and uh, get our feet wet with something that's pretty well established. And what's important for Amaraja is our strength is not so much in core R&D and, uh, you know, creating absolute things from scratch. Our strength is setting up extremely effective, efficient, high quality manufacturing ecosystems. So I want to master this, you know, from the uh, mixing, coding all the way to the end, two gigawatt hour, and then be able to scale up from there. So definitely LFP is on our roadmap and that'll be the larger part of our footprint going forward. And as for form factor, I think the basic kind of uh, what we looked at is in, a, in a, something like lithium, what we're doing for the first time, the less, we, the less complexity we can build into the system, which means less form factors, less chemistries, that's what we're shooting for. Now, ultimately, we do believe we have to take a two chemistry approach, a dual chemistry approach. Uh, but when it comes to form factors, it's going to be predominantly between prismatic and uh, cylindrical. Pouch, I think at this time, while they're 
every form factor has its uh, you know pros and cons it's something that we're not keen to kind of look at at this point in time uh, the last thing I think you mentioned about uh, the kind of the lines, how flexible we want to build them. I think one learning I've had as of late is, uh, and obviously this changes every day, right? Something something new comes, but building flexibility into lines is complex and it's also quite, uh, what do you say, it's, it's not an, a very efficient process. So for example, when you look at the kind of the end-to-end -end process of lithium cell making, when it comes to mixing, that's an app mixing and coding. It's an absolute no-no. You sh you cannot build flexibility. So let's say for my commercial plant, which is a, I, I'm, I'm willing to do many changeovers, many cleanings and stuff because it's not meant to be running 24 by seven. It's more of like a qualification plant. I can build in flexibility. But when I'm trying to run two gigawatt hour line, four gigawatt hour lines, you can't kind of do frequent switchovers between chemistries. So if you're having an LFP cathode line, that needs to be absolutely isolated, the HVAC system, everything. There can be no cross-contamination. Your anode line shouldn't have any cross-contamination. So I think there, we're not really trying to build flexibility. If ever we need to build, change out our mix, I think it'll be like a one-time complete system change and then uh, and can continue, continue from there. From the assembly formation and all, that's more or less chemistry agnostic. So whether it's a LFP or an NMC, you're putting into the same form factor, same size, that we can build in fungibility. But, uh, Everything else, I think we're more or less, on day one, whatever bet we're taking, we should try to be as consistent as possible. Um, since we're on the subject of chemistries, um, Vikram, um, one of the challenges in industries such as ours in this day and age is that you make an investment and then you, know, you don't sleep at night because you worry about redundancy as the tech moves fast. Um, what is your view on uh, the evolution of sodium ion as a potential replacement in a large way for lithium in applications where it makes sense, for example, static energy or um, three wheelers, two wheelers, where you don't really need to walk or, you know, you, you, you really, you, you're more about distance in the last mile. Um, is that something that's already on your radar and you're looking at your investments and seeing how you might be able to integrate sodium? I think sodium kind of falls in that category for us that's like beyond three to five years. I know there's some people going a lot more aggressive behind it. I think where I see sodium kind of fitting in, I think the first thing that's a little bit concerning to me is that, uh, you know, in theory, it's great. Uh, sodium is cheaper than lithium and uh, it should bring down costs. It should at, at the cost of a little bit of energy density. But I think one thing that's a little bit uh, we're, we're looking for, we're trying to see consistency of companies who are investing in sodium or talking about sodium as to, you know, the general characteristics of the chemistry. Like if you look at NMC chemistry, I think now we all more or less know that it's going to be something like 700 to 1500 cycles, depending on how dense you make it. We know the density ranges it'll fit. LFP similarly, we know cycle life and approximate energy density ranges. But sodium, I think I've seen some very wild uh, variations, which I'm not really able to reconcile at this point of time. And uh, I've also seen extreme variations in the cycle life. So ultimately, if my my current hypothesis is that if you can get sodium to be something like a around LFP density, even at a less LF than LFP density, but have extremely strong uh, performance characteristics around cycle life and heat performance, I think it's a it's a definite winner in the longer term for energy storage. Because in energy storage, what do we want? We want kind of a plug and play, forget about it solution, maintenance free. So I can put it in the most remote location, hot or cold, and it's going to work come what may. So if that's uh, that's a niche, I think sodium will be able to fill very effectively. But I'm not really seeing consistency in the people working on sodium, saying that it will be able to deliver on those uh, cycle lives and energy density. Um, so Vikram, I want to then talk about um, pack versus cell. You mentioned how your cell manufacturing investment and capacity will be much more than packing, and that's because a lot of people want to do their own packing. And when we uh, ourselves in the in in this industry watch the evolution we were scratching our heads because we were seeing two wheeler companies companies making two wheelers electric two wheelers deciding to pack their own cells and then people making electric rickshaws want to pack their own cells and then car companies and truck companies you know wanting to pack their own cells and we were in, in uh, our team was in Scania in in Sweden uh, three weeks ago and we saw that they are having this huge cell packing line you know for their own for their own cells and it's almost going back to Henry Ford in some ways, you know, for an automotive company to want to go upstream in its value chain and try to control some elements of it, uh, which was something they delivered from for, you know, very aggressively over the last 30 years. Um, we, for a while, watched this um, 
under the impression that this is happening because the lead acid industry hasn't stepped up and you know there isn't there isn't an ecosystem to provide them to provide the automotive OEMs what they need if we, you know faster better cheaper more nimble flexible and so they've had to do it themselves yet from your perspective it's actually them now wanting to do it themselves because they want to keep the value uh, themselves so i'm interested what's happening here and what what is the long term evolution going to be i uh, you know it's 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 hard to predict but at least if we look back at history like you said you know once upon a time it was unheard of every automotive uh, you know company would want to make their own engines their own critical components but then you know even engines and transmission everything is kind of the, you have primes now right who will make it they'll co-locate they'll do whatever you want but i i think over a longer period of time i do believe that auto, that delevering may happen again where automotive companies are willing to kind of give back some of the space to us on uh, the component suppliers saying that why don't you do this for me why don't you kind of they'll have their own arrangements but i think in the short term uh, a couple of things i still feel that the positive trend is that cell makers will be independent because even though you see some pretty significant investments by uh, let's say Volkswagen group is doing it on their own uh, BMW's announced uh, you have that uh, ACC a couple of others that are kind of coming up the fact is the largest capacity is still held by independent cell players right CATL dominates the market i think they're still looking at even a long term 50% plus market share uh, you have a lot of players like that so the top 6 are still independent cell makers so at least on the cell side even where you see some OEMs coming in uh we've seen like Ford is tying up directly with cell makers for captive plants but it's still the them coming in and putting it but uh i i think that right now it's because nobody's really able to do it and uh, nobody there nobody's kind of filling that uh, demand or that know-how that maybe that's why the auto OEMs are kind of being a little bit uh, cautious in doing this maybe they think that the value add is not there the other day i was talking to you know Uh, my friends over at Log9 and they gave a pretty they they take a pretty aggressive approach they said listen the only differentiation any EV maker can give is range and charging time and that's all on me in the pack so they they take an extreme approach that says i can become an OEM easier than they can become a battery maker so i don't necessarily prescribe to that i do believe that uh, there's a logic right now that says the the simpler the vehicle yeah you don't have much differentiation to give right you can differentiate how fast you charge how the range and there's not many other things are giving but over a period of time we've also seen vehicles are getting a lot smarter right so uh, especially cars i think uh, it's going to be a lot more when you start going autonomous and the, the entire like uh, what happens above the powertrain is going to be the really real unique experience and maybe over a longer period of time you'll see that the powertrain uh, you know ev- more or less everything will operate the same i don't think the speed and noise and power maybe these things will cease to be very important to people So over a longer period of time I do believe that uh, uh these things will start to get back into will have a scope to supply. Uh two wheeler and three wheeler, you know, we have to see. Uh, the rule of thumb still says about half the market is uh you know open to uh, pack makers, but when we see that uh they 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 have less value to add above the powertrain, let's say. Um how fast you charge was a comment you made uh, uh, your company is also playing in the charging space uh, and so you you make batteries you're in this biggest lead acid battery company you're now potentially going to be in this biggest lithium company if you get it right and move first and move fast and you get the quality right but you're also in other parts of the value chain let's talk about that Vikram. what what are the what are the other areas in the value chain for EVs that's on your radar So uh, just to kind of going back the first company actually that was started in the Amaraja group is a small company called Amaraja Power Systems and at that time uh, when uh, my grandfather first came back to India I think he saw he was he was a he was a electrical engineer who worked on like power plants specifically nuclear power plants in the United States so when he was walking around some of the generation stations in India he saw that some of the the batteries and specifically the chargers at that time were a little bit uh, he felt that we weren't some of them were a little bit behind the spec behind the time so he actually the first product we got into was more of like an industrial charger and uh, i think since then uh, we've we've also noticed you know in the group we always learn you know it's unfortunate power electronics are an equally critical piece of the you know the total solution but for some reason it always gets outshadowed by the battery because the battery is more expensive i think that's the only reason really it's not that uh, it's more critical to the the uh, total solution so going forward we believe that we have to be kind of more of an integrated solutions player 
the battery alone kind of only delivers so much value. You have to have the power electronics, you have to have the ability to integrate software controls and bring that entire solution together. So when we see that, some of the simpler examples where we have our largest market in the chargers now is these portable chargers. So every single you know electric two-wheeler, three-wheeler goes with one of those. It's very small. They range from like 500 watt as the smallest to two-wheeler charger up to like 3.3 kilowatt chargers for three-wheeler. Uh, this is a full range that we're trying to build and uh, we're trying to localize this as aggressively as possible. We also see that the most recent uh, you know revisions to the fame subsidy, they're going to be a lot more strict, right? saying that the vehicle itself is not the only you know, part of the solution. Even your critical ancillaries like your charge journal have to be localized. So I think that's the immediate term. That's the biggest market we see. And it's also important that you bring the right level of sophistication to these products. Uh, what we found earlier, we were selling you know, more or less a IP20 telecom rectifier wrapped around and put some controls on it. And that's not going to work because uh, it's a roughly used product. It goes on in the market. It's a so whatever the customer has tested in a factory ceases to be effective the second that uh, you know the rickshaw driver puts it on the ground to charge it or we've even seen extreme cases where the cord which is not really meant to be weight like load bearing uh, they're stretching it as far as possible it's holding up the entire you know battery and everything like that so it's a, it needs to be ip67 i think that's a must and uh, these are not things i don't think you know Government can come and regulate things, but I prefer that just industry learn for itself what's going to be effective and make it work. Uh, but this is a product that's mostly imported from China today. So we do feel that maybe in the short term, we also have to be more of like a technical alliance with an established player. But over a longer period of time, this is something we want to completely localize in India. Uh, coming to, you know, other future products, I know, of course, you've made great strides in the DC fast charger. So, you know, I tip my hat to you on that. I, I it's a little bit, uh, I would have hoped that market would have grown a little bit faster. The reason these portable chargers are going a little bit faster is because it's, it's one per vehicle, right? So one vehicle sale, one charger sale. But the larger chargers, DC fast chargers, this is not, uh, you know, I would love if one went with every vehicle, but that would make it obscenely expensive, right? So I think it's taking a little bit longer, but we would like to kind of have some localization on that as well. And uh, while I'm not personally a big proponent of swapping, we do have a couple of designs available in which we can offer the swapping model as well. And, uh, you know, maybe I'll just jump the gun. The reason when I look at like swapping versus charging, you've seen certain business models that work, certain ones that don't. Uh, if you go to a Taiwan, a Gogora model worked very well, right? It, uh, it, it made it very affordable as a subscription. Uh, there's, I think that, but in India, the same model that Bounce tried, you know, it's, it's a great attempt, but it also led to a lot of uh, when ownership is delinked from uh, you know, the use of the, a product, people don't tend to take the best care of it. There's, a, there's no kind of accountability for the, the health of the battery. I'm not seeing that uh, outside of captive fleets, outside of a very, very con highly controlled ecosystem, that uh, delinking battery ownership from vehicle ownership will be very effective. I'm, I'm happy to be proven wrong. In any case, I want to have a solution I can give to the customer. but. I would definitely rather prefer for, you know, more available charging, faster, safer, faster charging rather than swapping. Um, so I'm going to come to the elephant in the room then on um, clean mobility, and that is the religious um, argument that happens between uh, electric vehicles and hydrogen. Um, and I'm sure from your perspective, your um, strategy team has poured over future trends not just within chemistries and form factors, but also redundancy of lithium in the long term and what happens when everybody moves to EV and there's an in inadequate amount of lithium in the world to service that demand and therefore what happens with harvesting used lithium, second life, uh, uh, you know, and, and things like that. But beyond that, of course, is hydrogen. And I'm interested in your view on hydrogen versus electric vehicles. I think at the risk of crystal ball gazing, because anything really beyond three to five years I, I think my guess is as good as anybody's, even if we're in the industry. Uh, in the immediate future, my, the reason, like I said earlier, our bet is clearly on lithium is because the immediate area where I think you're going to really, really see India emerge as a global leader is going to be this light and local mobility segment. Uh, and simply for, if no other reason, we're the largest two-wheeler market in the world, we're the largest three-wheeler market in the world, and maybe one of the few three-wheeler markets in the world. So the critical mass we can build here in that, uh, you know, light uh, local mobility, the fact that e-commerce has taken off so successfully here, digital uh, you know, business models take off so successfully, 
this urban light mobility, I think it's going to be what dominates the landscape of India for you know at least the next couple of years, the near term. And that's I I don't see that going towards hydrogen. And, you know, if nothing else, you're not being a technical expert. Uh, battery is more convenient. It's a uh, when you're when you're not kind of uh, uh, there's no range anxiety because it's urban mobility. You can you can charge frequently. You can find charging fairly easily. Uh, I don't think there's any kind of new system that can kind of beat out charging. And uh, especially when you have portable chargers, ease of access to electrical grid. Where maybe hydrogen, I think, uh, of course, we have to see because there's plenty of people working on this from the EV side as well. When you start extending ranges, when you start looking at longer, uh, maybe let's say trucking, you know, uh, freight, uh, even uh, long haul busing, can hydrogen start to win out against EV? Uh, my theory at this, my hypothesis at this point in time is yes. But I also believe that building a hydrogen ecosystem is, uh, as much as we talk about building a charging ecosystem being uh, uh, complex, that's actually relatively easy because anywhere you go in the country, you already have an electrical grid. It's just about installing chargers and putting the right connections. Building out a hydrogen ecosystem, I think, is infinitely more complex and uh, hydrogen as a molecule is not the easiest to work with, right? So if you, we're, we're a country that still doesn't have piped gas far and wide and gas is something that's been easily replicated all over the world whereas a hydrogen grid pumping hydrogen from one part of the country to another I at least the people who've worked on these projects that I spoke to it's a nightmare right so uh, maybe the fact that we're talking about doing more electrolysis generating hydrogen where you need it to be consumed on on spot that can be looked at but that takes a lot longer so in the immediate future I don't see hydrogen coming in a, a very aggressive manner unless we're able to really figure this out I think the the technical complexities of putting a hydrogen grid and ecosystem around the country is, is much harder. I, I'd say we tend to agree with you uh, in our own uh, assessment. Hydrogen will uh, be an economic choice if you are going long. So if you're a train, plane, bus, taxi, truck, going a distances of a thousand kilometers uh, in, in that voyage or, or in the day, um, then hydrogen starts to, um, um, to become more economical. And then you'll see the hydrogen network develop on those niche routes, whatever they may be. Now, quite easy for a plane or a train, a little bit more difficult for a car, but easy again for a bus or a truck because it's fleet depots. And so, you know, you're, you're basically hydrogenating, so to speak, the fleet depots. And so it's, it's an easier, you know, closed loop uh, kind of system. So I, I'd agree with you. It's something over the horizon four or five years from now. And it'd be interesting to have you back on the show at that time to see uh, which way the, the market evolved. Um, I'm going to ask you the last question, which is the question we ask all the talent that comes on our show, Vikram. And I apologize for the frivolous nature of this question, but it always does bring about a very pointed and clear answer. And so the question is this. If you, Vikram, had the opportunity to be Prime Minister of India for one day, just one day, and you could make any decision you wanted to facilitate faster adoption of clean and electric mobility in India, what would that decision be? I would actually take a second look at hybridization, is what I would say, because uh, I think uh, one of the things I said early on was that anything we do as a country, I think we need to look at sustainability. And sustainability is not, a, you know, everyone wants to talk about the environmental angle, diversity, other things that come in. but. My only concern is uh, any new technology, any new solution we bring to this country, can this country be self-sufficient in that and do it over a very long period of time economically? So I, I do worry that in some areas like cars and all, are we moving to EV in a very haphazard and possibly even leapfrogging before we're ready? Uh, I could be wrong because I, I am very happy with what I'm seeing on the two-wheeler side, the three-wheeler side, but that's a unique market to India. Uh, I would definitely say that I would love to see increasing levels of hybridization and if i was the government i would say just start mandating the emissions norms right don't tell don't don't tell companies how to technically solve problems rather just say this is how much carbon you're allowed to output come up with solutions uh, so uh, maybe that's a very you know uh, idealist answer but that's what i would do Excellent. This has been an incredibly enjoyable conversation, Vikram. You are a very clear-headed leader with uh, very pointed answers, and that makes for a very enjoyable conversation on a podcast. It's going to be um, very interesting and rewarding, I'm sure, to watch the investment made by Amara Raja come alive in uh, 2025. And I'm sure that the automotive industry is also waiting 
um, so that they, you can relieve some of their uh, supply chain pressures uh, and for them to be able to comply with, uh, with local content as well as not having to deal so much with imports from China and all the headaches that that causes in the, in the import supply chain for us in India. Thank you very much for having made the time. Good luck with the investments and we look forward to having you back on the show soon. Thank you so much.